Welcome to Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm pleased to have as panelist Mike Giles is, does substitute teaching, but uh, uh, his claim to fame in my eyes is that he is a recovering Democrat, which means he understands how devious people can be, but he is an honest man, so he is now a libertarian, and I really appreciate that. Well, thank you. And uh, to Mike's, well, left on your screen, to the right in my hand, uh, is uh, James Just, who is vice chair of Libertarian Party of Sacramento. And uh, very dedicated, and multi-talented guy, right? It's always a pleasure to be here with you, Lee. Excellent, thank you. And my name is Lee Welter. I, at one time, was the secretary of Libertarian Party of Sacramento. <coughs> now I have the joy of helping put together this uh, panel discussion <laughs> on libertarian, well, a different perspective on popular or political at current events. Uh, we'll see how that goes. And uh, we have a list of topics here that are pertinent. In fact, I like this one to start with. Uh, everyone is born libertarian. Uh, that's what Bob Zadek says on his Sunday morning uh, longest running libertarian radio show. Yeah, I listen to that. I, I do too. But why don't we all take action? Because there are reasons. In fact, um, could libertarian propaganda be better? Absolutely. And we're all, we're immersed in propaganda. Uh, one expert uh, is Edward Bernays the father of public relations. And I'm just gonna read this because uh, this is what he wrote. His book is titled Propaganda. His opening sentence reads, quote, the conscious and intelligent manipula manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. They didn't talk about a constitutional republic democratic society, and we're told that we have to be a democracy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. 37 years later, after uh, the 28, 1928 book was published, uh, Jacques Ellul, sounds French to me, authored his book, Propaganda, the formation of men's attitudes, concluding that fewer than 10% of us, we're probably in the, we're 10 percenters here, can resist propaganda's powerful influence. Well, propaganda is not necessarily a dirty word. We need better propaganda to help people understand why and how they're libertarian and what they should do about it advertising is propaganda, but it seems to me that the people who call themselves journalists are almost overwhelmingly in favor of the socialist tendency. Am I wrong? Tell me, straighten me out if I'm wrong about that. Well, well I, propaganda, I would like to say, someone once, I heard somewhere, someone say the difference between propaganda and art is propaganda has a clear message. Art is open to interpretation. And so everything essentially is propaganda. Anybody who has a message they want, a specific message they want to get out is engaging in some form of propaganda. So it doesn't necessarily have to be bad. If you're telling people not to smoke because it's bad for your health, yeah. that's actually propaganda. It's just, you know, for the betterment of an of, uh, individual person. So propaganda itself is not necessarily bad. If you abuse the use of propaganda so you can unwittingly uh, manipulate people in a way that they would otherwise not behave, then you're starting to get into areas where it's if ethically <laughs> iffy, iffy well, shall we I, say. I could add, my understanding is that Joseph Goebbels, uh, the Ministry of Information for Adolf Hitler in Nazi Germany, was a real fan of Edward Bernays. He understood the potential and he put it to good, well, Put it to well, powerful use. Powerful, 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 powerful use. use. Yeah. Effect, effective use. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, there's a difference between effective and good, right? Just because yeah. you're good at something doesn't right. mean that the way it turns out is a good result, right? It's just, you know. 
Uh, yeah. Do you have something to say about Edward Bernays or propaganda? Um, yeah, well, uh, um, that was a really good point there about uh, good versus effective. Um, like, I understand that Joseph Stalin was like a very elevated uh, level of piano playing, um, concert level, and things like that. Oh, good for him. And I... I, I he should have stuck with it. <laughs> yeah. I heard uh, that speech that Hitler gave in 1933, I think, all in German, but I just listened to it, and by the time it was over, I had goosebumps. I mean, the guy is one heck of a good speaker. Oh, I yes. didn't understand oh, no, a word yeah, he, he said. Was very but it, <laughs> inspirational, no question of that. So these guys are brilliant. And I'm sure all the Roman Empire emperors were brilliant. And the Ottoman Empire is, you know, intellectually brilliant, but they were evil. There's, there's a and, fascinating uh, article online titled The Hitler Test <clears throat> by Butler Schaefer. S-H-A-F-F-E-R, I think. And every two or three years, he would give a test to his student class. He might have been a law student or a, a law professor. And he would describe two candidates for president. One of them loved small animals and young children <laughs> and was a real environmentalist and had all sorts of virtues. Mm -hmm. The other one had been a smuggler, was a, a put up some violent resistance to the government and uh, uh, grew tobacco and uh, anyway it was a it was a collage of our founding fathers and the first one was a description of Adolf Hitler yes and absolutely. invariably the class would vote for the virtuous of sounding guy mm -hmm. and later on in the class uh, Professor Schaefer would tell the class about, well, you know, this is really guy, he's very, has a lot of appeal, and the student said, well, how can you say that about such an evil man? He said, well, your class elected him president. <laughs> how do you explain this? <laughs> yeah. oh. And there, there, is a, uh, there is a good online movie, YouTube, is called The Wave, W-A-V-E. It's about a history teacher it's for almost 45 minutes long, but it's, it's worth watching. It's about a history teacher that answers a question in, that was raised in his classroom about history. And how could these people fall for this guy who created all kinds of problems for people? And uh, he, he, before long, he had them saluting their own special salutes and, and what have you. And, wow. uh, and trying to recruit people to join the group, and it was very exclusive, so that was highly desirable from that point of view. Oh, wow. And finally said, well, who's, we're going to introduce your ruler, and, well, anyway, I don't want to give it all away, but it's, it's, it's pretty fascinating. It's group mob psychology, how people can fall into line when they're, when they're set up. Well, we watch that happen every election season, where people just blindly fall in line behind their party, behind their party's banner, and whoever happens to be holding that party banner at the moment, and they'll vote for them whether they're vile human beings or not. Well, I know some people who say, well, wait a minute, John Fitzgerald Kennedy was a virtuous man, and he was a Democrat, right now, He'd, he'd never fit in with the Democrat Party, oh, would they'd he? they'd throw him off the stage. Well, he wouldn't survive the Me Too movement. He simply wouldn't. So it's... That, oh, uh, good point. They didn't think about that. <laughs> I mean, it, in the, well, maybe he's a Dem if he was a Democrat, he might. But it's still, it's the, the Me Too movement. Uh, the people of our past, you know, are, do not survive the modern uh, moral outrage machine that we have today. No, but of course nobody can. Hardly anybody can, exactly. And I, I won't make any confessions here, but uh, you know, somebody asked, would I, would I want to be a candidate for public office? I said, no, I wouldn't vote for me. <laughs> well, I was a candidate for public office. Oh, and I would, you. I would you vote. You will be again. I, well, probably not. Oh. And I would be, but I was prepared to answer whatever questions that Good. came up as, you know, as honestly as can be answered. But because you can't be afraid. One of the things that in today's society that, that you actually have to do is don't apologize for things that you've done because it just makes the outrage machine worse. Yeah, it'll just fire it up. It just fires them up and then you end up losing whatever 
strength you actually had. So yes, I was this way. I've changed, and it, it is what it is. But we we do have some inspirations. We have um, uh, Jeff Hewitt, elected uh, county supervisor in um, Riverside County, which is it is a plus for a libertarian. Uh, We've had libertarians elected mayor, Mayor of Bellflower, Art Olivier at one time, and to uh, water boards and recreation departments and that sort of thing. I think there's like 800, is it 800 across the country elected oh, that's libertarians? that's pretty good. Is it yeah. five or eight? I've, it's one of the two, I, I'm, so don't quote me on that, but no, it's but one of the two. With rare exception, they've been accepted very well. In fact, Jeff Hugh did great. He, he was mayor of, um, uh, was it Cala Mesa? Something? Cali Mesa, yeah, up, up, uh, I, I, up in the, towards the eastern end of Riverside County. Yeah, and I could be wrong, so I... No, just, I think you're right, Cali Mesa, and uh, he realized that paying a state agency for fire protection was outrageously expensive, so he terminated that contract and uh, found a, a more cost-effective way, and I think it probably had some excellent professional firefighters assisted by volunteer firefighters. Mm -hmm. And there's some communities where you can do that. The volunteers are dedicated mm -hmm. uh, to make good teams, follow, to follow uh, their leadership and the like. So that's a good thing. And before we run away from uh, Edward Bernays, I'll tell you how he got to be the father of public relations. Well, in New York City, some of his friends would produce plays and they knew to be successful, they had to, they had to make a hit from the very start. If they had two or three bad showings, poor attendance, yeah. oh, their investment was down the drain. Yeah. So they said, Edward, what can you do to make this work? very clever guy, he contacted the reviewers and said, on opening night for our play production, we'll have a limousine pick you up at your home, take you to an excellent restaurant for a good meal, and then from there take you to the playhouse where you can watch the play. Well, Hard to imagine they were in a bad mood by the time they got to the play, right? Yeah, yeah well, yeah, you're, in, you're kind of primed to have a good experience, right? It, it's, exactly. It's, it's the whole yeah. point. It was very effective. And Clever the emotional guy. power, emotion of the experience overwhelms the intellectual. Um, there's, there's another example of that phenomenon in uh, one of uh, Malcolm Gladwell's books titled The Outliers, um, in which he, he describes four criminals, very brief bios, and asked, which one of these do you think should get parole and which one of them should not get parole from the parole board? In the next sentence, don't bother reading the details in this. I'll tell you the secret. The, the applicants for parole were considered shortly after breakfast when, when the parole board members were well fed and cheerful and had a, in a good mood. They were more likely to get parole. And if it was at the end of the morning when they were tired and hungry, put them back, stick them back in their cages, right? But what was the theory oh. back? You, you never, buy a, never buy a car that was built on a Friday afternoon? <laughs> oh, 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 I could, it's, I, it's, I, think there was I don't a theory know if I could go off the deep end on that one. I could make it really brief. Yeah, somebody, a friend, was having um, a late lunch at a bar tavern, not too far from where he lived, when he noticed the bartender setting up a shot glass of whiskey and a beer and a shot glass of whiskey, the length of this huge mahogany bar. He looked at the bartender and says, what the heck are you doing? What's this all about? The bartender looked up at the clock. He said, wait three minutes and you'll find out. Sure enough, three minutes later, the doors swing open and <laughs> just Folks rushed in, they lined the whole bar down to whiskey, guzzled the beer, and within 15 minutes, they're back out the door, the place is empty again. My friend asked, well, what was that? He said, 
That was coffee break at the Chrysler engine plant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sorry yeah. about that, Daimler Chrysler, but... Uh, yeah, if your that, engine that's, is that's, built that's, after that. You know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so make sure your engine's built before lunch. Anyway, <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, but the, the, the power of this uh, propaganda business um, um, hits me because you, you mentioned... Um, President Kennedy. Oh yes, he had a great propaganda machine going for him, didn't he? Yeah, and it's Camelot, right? Yeah, they, they call it Camelot. The, the, the glamorous Jackie. Yeah, she was fantastic, but uh, years and years later, um, uh, his brother turned out to be the only murderer in the U.S. Senate, and it was Question. okay. Well, no one ever said anything about it. Well, that's a question: was it murder or was it? Uh, negligent uh, homicide. homicide, manslaughter, and pretty and much. What did he have? Did he have anything against that young gal, Mary Jo Kopechny? Well, if you're driving drunk, it's murder. Uh, it's just well, you, you made the choice. I guess. I guess that's what happened. And rather than summon help, yeah, yeah, he, he just he waited till the next himself, morning. He saved himself. And uh, I read that later the uh, family. The bankrollers of, of the, the political business um, had one of uh, somebody in the Catholic Church with whom they had connections to go to the Kopechny family and talk about what a tragedy this was and, and how uh, uh, much grief that the Kennedys shared with that family and how it'd be a shame to just keep the wound open and royal things up and why not just let it heal naturally and uh, they never took action. Well, so there was never any thick envelope full of thousand dollar bills or anything? Well, I think oh. it was funneled through the church. But, oh, I see. Uh, okay. Uh, that, that could be wrong. I don't want to, yeah. I don't yeah. want to derogate the Catholic Church. But, no. Uh, well, they've got their own problems. They don't need... Yeah, and their books, if somebody wants not. to something about <laughs> Captain Quiddick, and there's some books written yeah. about that, people that really did the research. But it, really, it's an example of how the ruling class essentially lives by vastly different rules than the rest of us. If any of one of us had done that, we'd have been spending time in a cage. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's, so it's, it's really, the example of that isn't less more about the Kennedys. It's just about how the whole system is, is designed essentially to benefit the ruling class. Yeah, and that's been going since at least uh, long before the uh, Roman Empire. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's nothing new. It's, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll get, there's one of our topics that, that goes into that in a little more depth, but uh, the next one that, that I offer up here is uh, have the New Deal, that was Franklin Roosevelt. In fact, if you want to learn about Franklin Roosevelt, there's a book titled The Roosevelt Myth mm -hmm. by... Uh, somebody who was a John T. Flynn, who was a very w politically well-connected journalist of the time. And uh, that's sort of a sad story in a way, but uh, he was a figurehead, sort of a uh, unscrupulous one at that, but mm -hmm. uh, he had good PR people, no question of it. How many people realized that he had, had polio and was stuck in a wheelchair? Well, couldn't take you couldn't you couldn't show that in your photograph, could you? Yeah, well, the, the press knew, but yeah, yeah, but they were careful not to. Yeah, yeah go back to propaganda again. Yeah, yeah. Right. okay. <laughs> and and the and the next one that struck me was the Great Society, Lyndon Baines Johnson, and I confess that was before I fully educated myself. I was in a very narrow professional career track. I sat in Michigan Stadium, heard that speech, how wonderful, we're going to get rid of poverty mm -hmm. by doing this and doing that, and uh, I fell for it. I thought, well, yeah, that's I did a too. great idea. I did too. Yes, but then I read, and I don't know if this is true or not, uh, that somebody quoted Lyndon Johnson as saying, we're going to have those N words voting us for generations. Oh, yeah, that's been proved that. out to be true. Um, that's sad, isn't it? Well, I don't know how anybody could imagine that them saying, you can have all the kids you want and we'll pay you, but keep any man out of your house. That's right. They take the, um, the father and they substitute government yeah. for the father in a household. And 
That's not very healthy, is it? Yeah, well, it's, if you look back at history, the, the black family survived slavery, it survived Jim Crow, it survived uh, Reconstruction, it survived all these things, but it didn't survive the, the Great Society. Yeah, that's right. Up the Great the Society 19, Up through the 1950s, it, it was... Uh, yeah, they had struggles. It, was, and it, it would have been not fun to, to have... But still, the, the black family and even black, even the black um, businesses were actually thriving. Some of the biggest com some of the biggest companies in the country were black businesses, but they never survived the the Great Society. It completely yeah. it completely undercut the the communities. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, uh, that's why I've kind of termed it the the racist white liberal cabal, the the uh, Great Society people, because they at that time in the middle '60s, the black family had slightly more. Uh, two uh, two parent families and the white families yes, did. they were d doing extremely well. Yeah, and they were making it on their own. But then once that came along, the government money just piled in and just, you know. And, and there's another there's another example of that. It's not not just removing the fathers from the system, but uh, uh, there is a psychiatrist who worked in the worst section of London. <coughs> His pen name is Theodore Dalrymple, D-A-L-R-Y-M-P-L-E. Oh. Yes, he's good. And uh, his book is titled Life at the Bottom. It is about the culture of that section of London where the people are told, you are victims of society. Therefore, you're not responsible for your behavior. If I am a victim, it's your fault. You victimized me, right? Yeah, and, you did uh, it. <laughs> and they're, they're just lawless and evil. And, uh, well, and the problem and they, with that they is... they can excuse it. The problem with that is you can actually be true. You can be a victim of society, but that doesn't absolve your responsibility to behave like a, like a rational human being. How about the people who are going to what I call the government monopoly K-12 schools uh, who are taught certain things that really aren't very true, but uh, in fact, the, uh, that K-12 schooling was designed after the 1819 Prussian mandatory schooling, which mm -hmm. was designed to produce obedient middle managers and military officers. Yeah, obedient and, followers. Exactly, and, and where, where do you get entrepreneurs out of obedient followers? It doesn't happen, does it? No. And that's why no. some of the best paid teachers sent their own children to private schools. Oh, th absolutely. And they tell you, well, because that's my church. I, I, that's why they go to St. Yeah, that's uh, what they say. Uh, yeah. School. But uh, I'll, I'll never forget this um, guy that I listened to on the radio. He's a self made millionaire. He grew up in the Pico Union part of Southeast LA or um, rough mm -hmm. and tough, 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 tough neighborhood. Um, and his dad was really wild, tough guy that was thrown out of his house at the age of 12 and, and um, brought himself up. And, uh, but anyway, this guy spoke and he went to a high school called Crenshaw High School. I've heard of that. Yeah. And uh, it was a rough, tough place when he went there. But now, with the obedient followers thing happening, they have... Um, the high school graduates, I think it's either four or six, I don't know which percentage, of the graduates can function at grade level. Oh, and forget going thing. to college. None of them can go to college. But uh, most of the kids graduate at far below their, their 12th grade level of reading, writing, arithmetic. Their 10th grade level, 6th grade level at, at high school graduation. Yeah, and they're, it's, and it's they're graduating sad. them. Yeah, at they, that they, level. they graduate them just because they went through and spent the time, but they didn't learn. No, it's uh, really sad. And, and, and there was a time, I don't think it's happening anymore, when people said, these are unrepresented, underrepresented minorities. We need to put them in UC California universities. And they couldn't cope. Or other Ivy League schools, and, mm -hmm. or, I mean Ivy League schools, and, and they had trouble coping. It's very demoralizing, not a good thing. But I, I have an example of how schools could be better. I know somebody who did student teaching in Detroit. Mm. In one classroom, 
uh, one of these young thugs stood up and said, lady, I could slice your throat from ear to ear. And knowing there was a policeman in the hallway right outside the door, she said, I dare you, just go ahead and try it. Well, the guy backed down, fortunately. Uh -huh. But then within a few weeks, the same student teacher was in a different high school, a different Detroit high school. Um, I think it was the Woodward John Orr Corridor, which is not the best place to be, even passing through. Uh -huh. And she said, I was frightened, I was terrified, because the students, they all called me by my proper name, they sat down and they're paying attention, whatever, I thought, this is weird, what's going on here? During a break, she went to the teacher's lounge and told one of the regular teachers that this is really spooky, what's happening? The students are pretending they're all well-behaved. And she was told the principal of this school insists on discipline and good behavior among the students. Oh, that's great. It's amazing, isn't it? What a difference, yeah. a good leader. And uh, let's see, we've got a little bit of time, a yeah, minute, minute and a half here. Oh, okay. Uh, we have an author uh, affiliated with the uh, Pacific Research Institute named Lance Izumi. Oh, I've heard of him. Who's written a couple of good books. One is titled The Corrupt Classroom. Talks about all the other problems with some of the schools. It just boggles your mind to learn oh, what they are. Yeah. And then a more recent book titled choose diversity, which is, not, schools should not be one size fits all. They should be tailored to the student body. Mm -hmm. Even, there's, there's a school in New York City that caters to autistic children. It does a wonderful job with them. Okay. Very credible. Great. And there is a school uh, right off the uh, Oakland uh, Bay Bridge, midway between Oakland and San Francisco on, um, what's that called, Treasure Island. Oh. It's called the Life Learning Academy, where they take people from very poor neighborhoods and family situations, and they boost them up. They teach them life skills and values, and uh, it's working well. It's worked so well that their next step is to build dormitories, because how could somebody come in to school in the morning when they've been sleeping on a park bench with hardly <laughs> oh, yeah. Gee whiz. Yeah. So, it looks like we're getting really low on time here. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Oh, uh, thank we'll look you. Look forward to seeing you on, on another time here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks well, for joining our chat. Thanks, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank All you. All right.